Back in 1998, New Radical scored a worldwide hit with You Get What You Give. While the band may have formed just a year prior to their album's release and broken up a year after they got big, they aren't your typical one-hit wonder. They've still proven to be influential even in recent times, and today, let's talk about the history of New Radicals. The main catalyst for New Radicals was frontman Greg Alexander, who was born Greg Gaiotto in Gross Point, Michigan, an eastern suburb close to Detroit. Growing up at one point in a conservative Jehovah's Witness household, Alexander had what he'd consider a low-grade dysfunctional family. He would tell Spin Magazine that his parents seemed to change religions almost on a monthly basis. Due to his proximity to Motown, the genre played a significant part of his childhood and he and his mother would drive around Metro Detroit listening to the local artists on AM radio. Besides the Motown sound, rock and roll also played a part in Alexander's musical exposure. Using the family's piano, he'd attempt to learn songs, namely Band on the Run by Paul McCartney and Wings, and Kathy's Clown by the Everly Brothers. By his own admission, he'd eventually gravitated towards, and I quote, instinctually writing his own melodies because he couldn't learn other people's, and he began composing original songs with his sister Caroline. Once he reached his early teens, he'd take up guitar and drums, and that's when his pursuit of music turned serious. He'd join his older brother Stephen, alongside fellow classmates George Snow and John Mabarak in high school in an outfit called The Circus, who'd go on to perform at the 1984 Battle of the Bands contest. But as Alexander told The Hollywood Reporter in 2014, the songs of Prince would lead him to an epiphany, and he'd experience it by sneaking into a showing of the movie Purple Rain, while underage, recalling, the game changer for me was seeing Prince in Purple Rain at 13 or 14. Let's Go Crazy knocked me over my head, but when I heard the beautiful ones, it was all over. At that point, I knew I was going to be running away to California. Alexander had initially visited his aunt in California, where he'd observed, and I quote, that post-60s spirit that was still alive in the mid-80s. He'd find his surroundings easy to make the most of, visiting the open mic scene and even sneaking into a Grammy Awards ceremony, making note of all the artists present that he looked up to. But by the age of 16, over the summer, he'd sought to leave Detroit and reside in California permanently, recalling, I said to my parents, I'm running away to California to be a rock star. My mom knew I was serious, but my dad said, well, make sure you're back home in September for school if it hasn't come together. Making his way back to Los Angeles, Alexander was able to live between Compton, Studio City, and North Hollywood, in large part due to what he felt was certain generosity amongst the African Americans there, saying, it was the black community that really took me in. Thank God for that, or else I would have been sleeping on the streets. Alexander would also carry a bunch of demo tapes with him that he'd accumulated from studio sessions back home and would frequently shop them around Sunset Boulevard. This effort would pay off tremendously for him, as he'd eventually play those demos for producer Rick Knowles, who in turn led him to record executive Jimmy Iovine. Iovine, for his part, had a production deal with A&M Records and was willing to offer Alexander a recording deal with the label, but not before he turned 18. In the meantime, Iovine provided Alexander with an allowance, and the aspiring singer-songwriter would spend the next two years focusing exclusively on songwriting, particularly through bus rides and spending time on the beach. Following through on his word, Iveen signed Alexander to A&M Records, and when it came time for Alexander to name his debut album, he'd initially proposed the title, Save Me For Myself, but he changed it just before the release, feeling the original title would be in poor taste. Alexander would comment on the change, telling Polestar in 1998, The cover was me standing on a bridge with a broken mirror on my wrist, and it was before the Suicide Chic thing. In 1989, his debut album would be released with the name Michigan Rain, and led by the single In the Neighborhood. Despite the album's warm reception and becoming a minor hit overseas, its release coincided with major label Polygram buying out A&M for a hefty sum, as much as half a billion dollars, and as a result, he'd soon be dropped from the label. Alexander's momentum remained strong though, as he actually managed to score another major label deal with Epic Records, a subsidiary of Sony Music Entertainment by the early 90s. His follow-up album, Intoxification, saw him taking the role of co-producer alongside Rick Knowles, and although the album recycled several tracks from Michigan Rain, it also featured updated versions of the first album's title track, as well as Save Me For Myself, Intoxication would see a release on May 5th, 1992. The album had a punchy power pop aesthetic and bolstered music videos for the lead single, Smokin' In Bed, and its B-side, The Truth but it garnered a lukewarm reception, especially amid the commercial peak of grunge. 
Though an alternative artist, Alexander would recall feeling indifferent to the grunge scene at the time, saying, I refused to sound like that because it wasn't me. I couldn't fake that. I had to follow my heart creatively. Despite the album's lack of success, Alexander continued working with former child actor Danielle Brisebois, who performed backing vocals on the album. He would eventually help produce her debut solo album, Arrive All Over You, which she released in 1994. Prior to her music career, Brisebois was best known for portraying the character Stephanie Mills on the sitcom All in the Family and was nominated for a Golden Globe Award for her reprisal of her role in the spin-off series Archie Bunker's Place. But even though her profile as an actress would continue to rise in the late 80s, she would essentially retire from the profession and aim to branch out into music. Meanwhile, Alexander spent the next few years busking and traveling across Europe on a limited budget while also demoing new songs. Among them was a recording of the song You Get What You Give. By 1997, as luck would have it, a friend went ahead and took his demo over to Michael Rosenblatt, the A&R man responsible for launching Madonna's career. From there, Alexander would sign a deal with MCA Records, and this would be his third major recording contract. He'd reflect on his decision to go forward with the third signing, telling Polestar, I started getting a second wind in terms of thinking that I could use rock and roll for a purpose other than self-aggrandizement or celebrity or all kinds of b Later adding, once I thought I could make a statement about where society is at the end of the millennium, then I started becoming a bit more motivated about putting my songs out there. Breezebo would join Alexander as a backing vocalist, keyboardist, and percussionist, writing songs with him for their new project called New Radicals. The project was unique in that it had a revolving door policy where no member in the band was permanent. Among those members was Edna Swap guitarist Rusty Anderson, as well as various session musicians, including the late Paul Gordon, Josh Fries, and the producer on Alexander's previous two albums, Rick Knowles. New Radical's debut album, Maybe You've Been Brainwashed Too, would be released on October 16, 1998. The album took aim at consumerism, celebrity culture, and the public's apathy towards serious issues. When interviewed by Much Music, Alexander discussed how the title's meaning was pertinent to his situation growing up, revealing, Where I'm from is a place called Gross Point. My father was a plumber and we were all dark horses of the neighborhood around a lot of real snobby people. It gave me perspective at a young age that there's this idealization of the upper class. He would add, unless you run a bank or own a car dealership, you can't afford to feed your family. That's the kind of situation we're in right now. The song You Get What You Give would be the album's second track and would steadily gain traction on both rock radio and on MTV. Alexander was taken aback by its success, recalling to The Hollywood Reporter, I was on Sunset Boulevard walking down the street shortly after the record came out and I heard the song blasting out of someone's car. My immediate instinct was, oh my god, someone stole my demo tape. I was really serious too. And then I heard it coming from another car like a minute later and I was like, oh my god, how did all these people get my demo tape? Once the song was released as a single on November 3rd, it went on to reach number 36 on the Billboard Hot 100. Eventually, it peaked at number one on the US Adult Alternative Songs charts, as well as Canada's top singles charts and the New Zealand chart, and charted very highly throughout much of Europe. In less than a year, New Radicals would tour the world, and the album would be certified platinum, and the music video for You Get What You Give would also be a huge hit. Helping push the song into the stratosphere was MTV's Total Request Live, having it air alongside rock giants at the time, Korn and Limp Bizkit. Alexander would tell Billboard in 1998 the meaning behind the song, saying, It's mostly remembering to fly high and be completely off your head in a world where we can't control all the elements. You have to maintain balance because you only get what you give. For Alexander, he came up with the song as a writing exercise, drawing from his own experience. The line, 4 a.m., we ran a miracle mile, references his time living around LA's Miracle Mile area, while the lyric, we're flat broke, but hey, we do it in style, drew inspiration from the time he couch surfed around LA after he lost one of his recording contracts as a solo artist. However, the part of the song that garnered the most attention was one of the final lyrics where he name checks celebrities including Courtney Love, Marilyn Manson, Hanson, and Beck. In reality, name-checking the popular celebrities of the day had nothing to do with the personal beef he had with them, but rather an experiment Alexander wanted to undertake with the song. The earlier part of the song identified what Alexander thought were real issues, including the health insurance companies ripping people off, as well as the big bankers and FDA and cloning. 
He would tell Billboard magazine, I was a little bummed out that it focused on this absurd celebrity bash of people. I had no real issue with them versus something that I thought was challenging the powers that be in a pop song that got on pop radio all over the world while telling MTV in a separate interview how the song was misunderstood saying, there's this whole hysteria and curiosity over peripheral stupidity instead of focusing on real issues. And a lot of people I talked to asked me about those real things while a lot of the rock media tried to turn into a cat fight. As the song and the band's debut record began to find an audience, big names in the music industry also took notice and showered Alexander with praise most notably Joni Mitchell, who called You Get What You Give as an, I quote, the only song I have liked in a long time, and referred to him as an, I quote, my kind of punky white boy. Alexander would also get the opportunity to meet several of his musical idols during this time, including George Michael and Prince, who sang his praises. But Alexander soon became jaded with the music business itself, telling Billboard, my life was irrevocably changing and was no longer going to be about music every day, but a lot of the insanity that comes with the star machinery. It was following the success of the album's first single that the label had already shot a video for the next single, Someday We'll Know, and was about to release it. But in July of 1999, Alexander pulled the plug on the band, and the announcement even caught his label by surprise, who according to Billboard magazine, were even exploring suing him, but eventually came to a settlement agreement. Someday We'll Know would get a second life though, when it would be covered separately by Hall & Oates and Mandy Moore. For Alexander, he was tired of the celebrity culture and lifestyle writing in a statement at the time. It was an experience playing the artist, but I accomplished all of my goals with this record and I'm ready to move on and make the next step in my career, adding, I'm going to be turning 30 next year and realize that the fatigue of traveling and getting three hours of sleep in a different hotel every night to do boring hanging and schmoozing with radio and retail people is definitely not for me. He would also add that he wanted to be more like producer Mud Lang than a rock star. Years later, he would tell Billboard looking back, I've seen the Inside Dream Factory as a visitor. I got the visitor pass, if you know what I mean. When it actually started happening for real and I wanted to talk about injustice and politics and meaningful things, there was no support system. I had no one backing me up. I was young and disillusioned. It's like quite a bit of the writing on the wall about consolidation of radio cable companies, big business. He would compare the fame to being trapped in the Hotel California, adding, there was a part of me that felt like it was going to F and destroy me. I saw one chance to run out of the Hotel California. I think I realized the only way to do that was to burn the mother effort to the ground. It was following the breakup of New Radicals that Alexander would continue to work with Danielle Brisebois, producing her follow-up album Portable Life, which featured the members of New Radicals as her backing band. Although the album was scheduled for release on October 16, 1999, it was shelved for almost a decade when it was finally released as a digital download. In the 2000s, Alexander would move to London, at one point crashing with the band The Darkness. Despite leaving New Radicals in his past, the music industry soon came calling, including major label record executives like Clive Davis, pushing him to write more music, which led him to writing with and for other artists. He would use the pseudonym with the first name Alex and last name Ander when it came to songwriting credits and wrote hits for other artists who had proved to be popular across Europe and the rest of the world, including two chart-topping UK singles Murder on the Dance Floor for Sophie Alex Baxter and Life is a Roller Coaster for Ronan Keating. But his biggest hit of his career would be the 2002 Santana song, The Game of Love, which was originally demoed by Macy Gray. Despite another hit, Alexander still felt a little bit of disillusionment with the industry and sold his publishing while keeping his masters. As for who he decided to work with in his career, he would tell Billboard the benchmark was pretty low. It would be anybody who would call him enough times. It was following the sale of his catalog that Alexander soon started getting into charity work, working with various non-governmental organizations who deal with poverty in sub-Saharan Africa. By 2010, he was contacted by writer and director John Carney to compose music for a film he was working on called Begin Again, in which a down-on-his-luck record executive teams up with an aspiring singer-songwriter who was dumped by her collaborator and longtime boyfriend, and the two revived their spirits by recording an album together throughout various parts of New York City. Alexander would recall being inspired by the script, noting, and I quote, It gave me the impetus to walk away from my break. I was all guns blazing. I started writing songs immediately. The definitive song to lead the movie's 16-song soundtrack would be titled Lost Stars, which he'd written in 2012 with Brisebois alongside a few other writers. Alexander discussed his approach to writing the song, saying, The goal was for each lyric and sentiment to be a story, and a thought unto itself, but also to the greater mystery of life, which is that we are all coming and going in this life. We are just a lost star. We are a spark on the horizon. 
By his own admission, Alexander felt deeply affected by the composition, adding, The song is probably the saddest song I've ever written in my life, to the point where I had to morph the melodies and chords to try to make it uplifting. Once he'd sent the song to John Carney, he knew he had a hit on his hands, recalling, I got back the most beautiful email saying that he'd been crying on his keyboard. That was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had as a collaborator, he'd say. Begin Again would be released in June of 2014, grossing almost $66 million against an $8 million budget, and the song Lost Stars would go on to win a Hollywood Music and the Media Award for Best Original Song in a Feature Film. At the time, Alexander was interviewed for The Hollywood Reporter, and it was his first in-depth interview in 15 years since he'd kept somewhat of an anonymous profile. It was uncertain as to what he'd get involved with down the line. It would take a massive world event for him to bring back new radicals, and perform their hit song again, and it was... Joe Biden's inauguration, really? Okay, well, New Radicals came out of retirement. Alexander would tell Rolling Stone in 2021, a friend whose team made the Get Out the Vote videos asked me, Greg, the song has such a personal meaning to both the Biden and the Harris families. If they asked, would you consider performing the song as New Radicals at the inauguration? It sounded so far-fetched, I half-joked, only if you'd play guitar, but a month later I received an official request, so I said let's do it. When asked whether the New Radicals reunion would be a one-off, or if the band were open to doing more down the road, Alexander responded, I have unreleased albums with many songs, so when I can just figure out how to clone myself and send that person into the world for me to live this crazy life, maybe I can still be a contender, he'd say. He would go on to say, but seriously regarding the future, I often have a rabbit or two up my sleeve. And looking back, I'm very grateful that music's been a passport to a life I'd never imagined at 16 when I just stopped trying at school so I could save my energy to run home to my bedroom ramshackle studio to make off the wall demos. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like, button, and subscribe. And we'll see you again. Rock and roll your story sticker.